Okay, hi everybody, and uh, welcome to the uh, stand up for uh, for FPGA work at Open Research Institute for the 23rd of April, 2024. And what we do at this meeting is we talk about what we have done, what we have planned to do, uh, if we have any resources that we need or any roadblocks that we need help with. Um, and so I'll, I'll go ahead and start off with a report from, from Ken. So he has a, a meeting conflict, so he can't be here today. Uh, but he is modifying the polyphase filter bank, um, and he's going to to adjust it to the uh, sort of the realities of this particular uh, dev board. Um, so he's going right now. He's assuming a 10 megahertz uh, bandwidth for the for the uplink, uh, so frequency division multiple access uplink. And well, 10 megahertz is too low for this particular. Um, chip to, to do. And we, we knew that. Uh, we know that we have to write a configuration file or a profile for uh, for the ADRV 9009. Um, and we can we can get down to, to 30, 31 uh, mega samples per second. So he's going to go ahead and go for 40 and in the design. So that puts us into the zone where we can actually configure the um, the the development station to do. So we're making those sorts of adjustments at this point. The basic polyphase work from Theseus cores um, is, seems to be working. Um, and every week that goes by, I think we understand it a little bit better. Um, but he's going to go ahead and modify it so it actually can can work end to end. Um, he talked about essentially like just increasing the 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 filter bank up, you know, to some very large number. Um, but like the overall throughput, that would be quite quite a lot. So we want to keep to the eventually the, like ten megahertz, um, but but have it actually work on this particular dev board. So that's something he's been doing over the past week. Is his plan is to configure the ADC to supply a forty megahertz wide baseband signal with two X over sample, and he thinks that running a two hundred fifty six point FFT over forty megahertz instead of a sixty four point is we're keeping the same um, output frequency steps. And his plan is to add a masking counter that's active for 64 of the 256 outputs, masks the enabled of the PFB filter so that only the lower quarter frequency outputs are forwarded. I I think that might work, but I haven't looked at it in um, any more than, than just saying, yeah, uh, go ahead and, and match it up. Uh, and also he helped me uh, track down a problem that was uh, over on Opulent Voice with trying to integrate the custom block into the reference design for the for the Pluto, um, and also we want to integrate these blocks into the the 9002 or 9009, but it turned out to be a problem in the component XML and not uh, a problem in the tackle uh, for the board um, or system underscore board dot tackle, uh, which is where we thought the problem was. It turned out to be the component XML file. That's that's something that that's an export from uh, Vivado that that is part of the IP packaging process, and that's where the problem ended up being. We still have the problem that we are not really sure why we can't add a bus instead of connecting up individual signals. Uh, as far as we can tell, the only reason that you'd really want to do this and add the whole bus is that so you get that cool drop down effect in the system board system block diagram. We, I was concerned that there was some other uh, effect here, like uh, including the clock signals in the in the Axi stream bus. I, I hope all that's working. We'll figure it out pretty soon if it's not. But as of today, um, the you know good segue to this is is that we are able to to place uh, custom blocks in the, like the Pluto reference design. Um, and this will also work for the the other two reference designs that we're working with. Previously, when we placed blocks, we used an external method of of doing this. Um, but now we're leveraging the the actual directory structure of the reference design itself. Um, so these are two different ways to do it. the The way that we used to do it was to keep the HDL separate, and and we would incorporate that, pull that in, uh, and then add our stuff in parallel um but this this up uh, what we're doing now with the with the blocks that we're working on for for opulent voice and for hyphoria is to 
uh, make them look exactly like ADI blocks, and they exist in the the library directory uh, alongside all of the other packaged IP components uh, that are in the reference design. So that's that's kind of what we've been up to, and we've had some su success there. So that's that's Ken's report. That's the bulk of my report. Um, aside from the the work on actually integrating the IP and and documenting all of that, so it's all written down in our documents repository. Uh, there's been some design work for Opulent Voice, uh, for, targeted for for FPGA, uh, both on the transmitter and the receiver. And the transmitter design is coming along. That's that's what I'm hoping to to put into the dummy block that's that's currently working in the reference design. And there's two different designs for the receiver. One is a traditional sort of IQ digital down converter, and we're getting very reasonable looking output at the end. And the other is a, a much more elegant uh, and capable design called Massey Hodgart, or it might be Hodgart Massey. And this is from a set of papers in the mid 1990s. Um, the other person very much associated with this would be um, uh, Dr. Sweeting. Yeah, uh, from Surrey, um, and so you can see all of that work in the Opulent Voice channel. Um, so, but neither one of those is really working yet. However, the work from the the more advanced version has the the clock recovery in it that we need for the digital down converter in order for that last stage to work. So, I think we're pretty close to sealing the deal on on that and at least getting it to work in simulation. We have three code bases that have been converted from HDL coder to VHDL, um, the business end of the, the transmitter, so the NCOs that multiply the, the baseband and, and uh, bit rate uh, uh, components for, for minimum shift keying, that, that was converted. It's human readable, looks kind of kind of good. Uh, some of it's confusing to me because it puts in a lot of extra layers for, for Axie and you know, there seems to be too many files for what it does, but it's it's there. It's uploaded to the repository. Uh, the second part is is uh, taking your bitstream and turning it into even and odd bitstream. So essentially distributing it, and that's that's an important part of this particular type of transmitter. You you take even and odd bits and you delay uh, your uh, odd. Uh, sorry, delay the even. Uh, by half a symbol or a bit time, and and that's how you get all the magic to happen. So that's a so that's the second part, um, and then the the there is a whole part. Uh, so the the sort of the the incoming uh, signal creating creating the bit streams in the first place, um, and that's the third section of the um, of the the conversion work. So we have three different chunks that we've done. Uh, these are three different subsystems in Simulink, and so that's some really good progress. So, trying to get all that to uh, to go into blocks that then go into HDL that then can be tested on the firmware side. The uh, the process of making a firmware image from scratch, we're already pretty good uh, for Petal Linux, which is used for the the big stations, but the relatively smaller chip on the Pluto Pluto SDR, uh, that's a a different process. It does not use Petal Linux. It uses BuildRoot. Uh, there's a make make script, and we have successfully made uh, from scratch just stock firmware. We're going to absolutely we're going to make sure that we know how to boot this over JTAG. But we've modified a Pluto with JTAG, and that's in the lab. Um, and so that's the next step. It didn't quite finish making and building yesterday, so so I don't have a report on whether that works yet, but I should very soon. Um, then you take that firmware image. You pull in your new HDL code, so we have a, a new XSA, a new bit file, um, modify the code, rebuild the image, JTAG it up, boot it up, and then from the processor side, order it around with uh, LibIIO uh, from a compiled C, uh, C file. The, the IIO stream example from ADI is what we're using. And then if we see what we expect to see, then we have proven that we can modify the HDL and produce uh, samples, uh, transmit samples, and that will open the door to, to then modifying that block, repeating all of this, and then getting a transmitter on the air. So successful block integration into the ADI reference design, 
um, successful Pluto firmware generation. It's still stock and unmodified uh, design work for Opulent Voice. And uh, finally, we're, we've got some work um, for, for a, a sort of a, a OFDM modem. So we'd like to, to get into that. Uh, and this is related to, to Neptune and, and FlexLink work. Um, so, so what we're looking at is like looking at the requirements for five gigahertz and like, what can we design like a, a relative, like back away from the complexity of the FlexLink specification, design a, a simple OFDM modem that is still in, definitely in the ballpark and can be used as a, uh, as a component. Um, you know, but, but bringing people up to speed and teaching them about OFDM and getting the basics out of the way first is, is kind of what we're, we're talking about doing there. So all that's definitely FPG re related as well. And that's targeted for the 9002, which is a, uh, for, that's a chip from ADI that's uh, from the mobile or, you know, mobile portable. So low power uh, transmit bandwidths, about 40 megahertz, uh, really nice, nice chip for, for mobiles. The 9009 that the transceiver work is targeted towards more of a base station chip. So those are the two different options that we have in remote labs right now. Okay, that's it for me. And I'll turn it over uh, to Paul because I think you probably have some remote labs uh, work and, and you probably have some, some opinions on Opulent Voice and how that's going. Okay. Um, what, what's my remote lab news? Seems like it's status quo ante. As far as I know, it's working. Um, yeah, I guess the, the one th the thing I was thinking of was compiling on Karapi is different than compiling on Chaco Cat, and I we have modified Karapi for specific reasons related to Simulate, and that seems to break it for lots of other things. And when we have disjoint capabilities on Chaco Cat and Karapi, this is most unfortunate, and uh, I'd like to find a way to around it, but I'm not sure that we know enough. And we could switch back and forth between the different uh, LibC implementations in theory, but we have not attempted to do that. So we're stuck. And Michelle is mostly taking the brunt of having to deal with different capabilities on different machines, but other people working on the same stuff will have the same problem. Yeah, the, the workaround with using the big directory was great. So I... Now, so now I know that that uh, that directory is is actually accessible from from any VM, and I didn't know that. I thought that the the big, uh, which was supposed to be like if you have a really large set of files, you need to put them in like cold storage or slower storage. That you use the big directory that shows up on your account, and I uh, I assumed that this was just a per VM thing, uh, but because it's available to anybody. The files that I put into Big, I then can go get from another VM. So, and then we I found out yesterday that it's a different user from different on different VMs. That was that was fun. Yeah, this um, is something I should have known in advance, but did not think of that. That volume is mounted on different VMs, and you can access it. But user access in in Unix is based on your user number, which is more or less arbitrary, depending on how, what order their users were created in, and rather than your username. So you may have the same username on two different Unix machines, but if they're sharing the same volume, a file you put there under your own name, maybe somebody else's name when it gets to the destination. So this is not a great way to share files. Can I um, uh, interject something here? Sure. Are, are we using like NIS or NIS plus? across our Linux VMs? I don't even know what that is. Okay, so NIST is a network information service, I believe. It used to be called Yellow Pages way back in the olden, olden days. But it's a way that you can share uh, group files and user usernames and user IDs and group names and group IDs across VMs. And then that way, you don't have this issue where the um, username will change from one VM or one Linux box to another, um, you know, because you'll have the same uh, usernames and user IDs across all the boxes and they're distributed through the, the NIST uh, structure. Um, we've used that for many, many, many years, you know, so that 
in, across all our um, Linux boxes at work so that, you know, we have, so we have kind of solved that problem. So it is solvable and, and that there's tools within Linux to do that. Yeah, I knew that there were. I just was not familiar with them. Did not realize that we needed them until yesterday. So, um, I mean, if, you, if, if there's, you know, I can help set that up if if you like. Yeah, I'd like to talk talk about that with you online, offline. Sure. Um, yeah, thank you. That was maybe too big, disruptive uh, big at this help. point. But worth thinking about. Um. And the usual customer support for uh, remote labs has been ongoing, but things are mostly working. I've yeah, thank you. It's been it's been great. Yeah, my own personal work. I've been concentrating on the old fashioned C plus plus implementation of the Forary FSK version of uh, Opulent Voice. Um, I've got it working now with all the new protocol stuff in place and. Uh, no GNU radio, so I can transmit uh, directly from code that I wrote rather than using GNU radio as a as an intermediary. As you may recall, the uh, each uh, the demodulator and the demodulator component both are incomplete. They require a front end, uh, which feeds the standard end of the of the component, and then a back end, which takes the output from a standard out of the component. Um, in order to interface with the radio on the one side and the audio on the other side. And now we have all those components in open source, although not all generated by us and, uh, and working. And I've, I've got a, what I hope is a very reproducible lab environment where each side is an identical Raspberry Pi running the uh, Raspberry Pi, Pi SDR uh, distro, which is an unofficial distro, but has all the SDR stuff pre-installed in it. Or, or a lot of it anyway. And uh, in my lab, <laughs> when I run it, it's reliable and consistent and I get nice demodulation and it locks in solid. And at University of Puerto Rico, it did not manage to repeat that feat yet. So I'm trying to be as re reproducible as possible and help them get past whatever it is is blocking them from, from using the stuff. And then they're on a previous generation. They're going to have to leapfrog up to what, what I'm on now, if they want the uh, the latest and greatest, that's not tied to an FPGA in any particular way. We use a Pluto to transmit, but we use the stock firmware uh, just as a as a standard SDR using IIO again. Um, so that's what I've been mostly paying attention to. Yeah, thank you for all that. It's a whole lot of work. Um, and then Everest also uh, explained how to reduce the um, the usage for for the HDL for uh, the Pluto because uh, that uh, that FPGA is a relatively small one so it's challenging to put in um, designs so um, his his work was to take our our DVBF s2 encoder and put it on the in, into Pluto HDL to make a kind of a really nice uh, package for uh, QO100 and and other work for DVBS2 on on the ham microwave bands. Um, so his repo clearly shows like here's how you turn stuff off and and get back space. Uh, a first draft naive sort of implementation of the of the business end of the NCOs and the multiplications for uh, for opulent voice um, just exceeded the. <laughs> Like alone, that was enough to to swamp the seventy ten. So uh, we've got our work cut out for us. It seems like uh, you know uh, some oscillators and some multiplications should should be able to fit in here, but we may need to go to uh, like the nine thousand two for for this. So we'll see. Uh, but I'm going to take his advice and and go in and uh, and and do the things that he did in his in his system board tuckle because uh, that worked. Um, and in that in that case, to to create that particular version of code, um, it's it's transmit only. And I think we're it'd be great to have a transceiver for for uh, opulent voice on the Pluto. But if we can fit in just the transmitter, that's still a big win. And that would actually fit the use case for the University of Puerto Rico and other uh, other launches like that. So 
you know, we're, we're, we're coming along. We'll, we'll find out a whole lot more over the next week. Um, anyway. Yeah. All right. So the, yeah, the floor is yours, Matthew. Okay. I don't have any, anything that I've um, worked on in particular or, you know, or uh, plan on this week, but I'm hoping I can find some things to help out with here and there. Um, one thing I did have a question for you about, you had mentioned the various pieces of the um, MSK transmitter, like then the, you know, the um, even odd and a couple of things. What I didn't hear and I was curious about is um, a differential encoder. The receiver is kind of dependent on a differential decoder. I think it's actually kind of built into the receiver anyway. So I think there's a differential encoder piece that, that needs to be there as well. Oh, yeah. Good point. I do not have that yet, but that would be, yeah, you're, you're right. Uh, it, that, that needs to be uh part of that. So I'm going to write that down. I mean, there's, there, it's fairly simple, but um, it's, it's important because I, it, it, you know, that's how the uh, receiver resolves phase ambiguity. Um, and I think most all the papers that we've looked at, you know, it's there implicitly I think it's stated in a few places, but it's it's there implicitly in, in all of them, it's my recollection. Right. Yeah, that currently is not in the Simulink or in any of the code. So I, that uh, it's on the list. Great. That was it. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. That's uh, super helpful and looking forward to the to uh, talking with you more about all the all the things going on. Um, I'm I'm optimistic that we'll get the the Hodgart Massey stuff working, um, and it it I think you mentioned that that you could clearly see kind of like how you would handwrite this and and RTL. Um, so far, I've not gotten the Simulink model to to behave, and it's probably just because of uh, this problem would be by, by not understanding the the implications of all the blocks in the block diagram. Um, but it it's not uh, completely catastrophically broken. You can sort of see what it's trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's relatively close. Uh, but I think like we talked on Slack, it if we can if we can if we want to just start writing blocks, like just start writing code, uh, I'm totally game for that. Um, that's we wrote the DVBS2 encoder from scratch. That was Swato's work with a help from from a variety of people. And then uh, Paul and I wrote the Cobbs decoder and we managed to write that from, from scratch. So the fancy tools have produced some pretty neat code, um, but they are tools. They're just assistants, uh, just like a lot of other uh, people's experiences with like AI or machine learning or automated tools. Um, the promise often greatly exceeds the grasp of the, of the stuff produced and um, you know, what goes in is directly related to what comes out. So uh, there are going to be, it's easy to see now after doing this for, for a number of months is that some DSP tasks are really good match for HDL coder and the Simulink approach and that some may not be. Um, and that the fact that they're not the best match is probably a limitation of, of me picking the right blocks because there is a limited number that you can work with in Simulink. It doesn't just turn any Simulink block into into VHDL. Um, so so you're limited. It gives you a limited set. However, you can also use pretty much any MATLAB function. So if you put a MATLAB function into a into a MATLAB function block in Simulink, that also goes into HDL coder. That code tends to be a little more wild. That output is is the interpretation of your function. Um, and it looks like they've pre-cooked the the simulant blocks that are sort of designated as HDL coder compatible, and those are the ones that really do look uh, like a person wrote them. So that's uh, there's no requirement that we have to use the fancy tools. Um, and if we can if we can get the Massey Hodgart thing working, that that has some significant advantages. It, the performance is is uh, you know better than the the sort of the you know looking at the digital down converter, just a straightforward IQ receiver. So I'm really looking forward to getting both working and then comparing them and and showing, being able to show uh, difference differences. Because um, I think in, in a lot of situations, people stop as soon as they get one type of thing working 
uh, but but having a comparison is a is a neat opportunity to be able to show these concepts uh, in an accessible way. Well, if it's all right, then I, I, I'll try in the next few days to put together a block diagram of what I would look, what I envision for a um, RTL implementation. Awesome. And, um, and we can review that and talk about that. And, you know, I'd be happy to start working through some of those. Yeah, that'd be great. I would really like that. I'd, I'd, I could probably uh, get, uh, get the usual usual suspects and, and maybe in a few new people to help out too. So, so yes, uh, that would be uh, fantastic. Look forward to that. Great. All right. And then uh, let's see, Rick, the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, you want to, you want to talk a little bit about the uh, earth Venus earth thing and if there's any potential for any FPGA coding stuff from from us because uh, that's a pretty exciting uh, far out in space kind of thing. Well, uh, I could summarize by saying that ham radio operators have been doing Earth Moon Earth communications for years, and that if you want to do that, uh, it requires a fair amount of commitment, but we at the Deep Space Exploration Society, who do Earth Lunar all the time with our modest 60 foot dish, uh, are thinking that we would like a bigger challenge. And we would like to try to do two way communications with another station, not just bouncing signals to ourselves, uh, off Venus. Now, that's a pretty big challenge. There are some advantages to doing that. Venus has a six times higher reflectivity coefficient than the moon does, which is very nice. And that is the only good news. It is a little bit further away than the moon. And so it has a... Uh, half loss in excess of 350 dB. So we need to do some things. And with all the resources we currently have, we're short about 40, eh, 35, 40 dB of closing the loop. Uh, the link, not the loop. Um, anyway, <clears throat> so, a few dB from more power, maybe a few dB from going to a higher frequency where we'll have a narrower beam width, maybe a few dB from a really fancy, expensive LMA and TR switch, uh, a few dB here and a few dB there. Well, the last hope for the last few dB would be to pick the best possible uh, coding uh, of the digital signal. We're not even trying to do voice here. Any signal that conveys information is sufficient for this, uh, as long as it conveys the basics, call sign and, you know, how are you and so forth. Uh, but we'd like to get, we'd like to get the maximum coding gain possible on whatever digital code we choose. And that, that's a little tricky, but we have one advantage that where terrestrial communications is nearly uh, immediate, the moon bounce, you've got a couple of seconds before you get a response. So there's been a lot of coding work to fill that couple of seconds with lots of redundant bits. Here we have about six minutes of time before we get an answer back. And so we can fill that time with a great deal of redundant bits. Hopefully sufficient number of them to close the link with all the other things also being done. And so I am writing, I've already started to write last night. I couldn't stop myself. I started to write a proposal that says, uh, 
we would like to do all these things because it has never been done before. And that's cool. So any thoughts that anybody in ORI or anywhere else for that matter has that might help us in our project, we're listening. I have a couple questions. Is, is there any uh, particular data rate that you're looking to achieve or can it just be really, really slow? Uh, no, no particular data rate. We're not trying to do voice or any of that stuff. We're just trying to send a signal with our call sign and maybe a signal report or some, you know, very small amount of information. Perhaps one might say similar to WSJT's uh, various protocols, the exchanges they use back and forth to say, hello, do you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Uh, here's your signal strength. I, I received that. Okay. So a few facts and force, but we're talking dozens of bits of information over a period of six minutes is what we're looking at. Right. Yeah, I just was, I was kind of curious if the WSJT or the Whisper protocols could be leveraged as they, they seem they're kind of suited for this type of work. It, it is the primary uh, focus right now um, is to take there is a version, I believe, of the of the protocols that are in that family of protocols that is actually, I think, three minutes long, if I'm not mistaken. So it's, yeah. Uh, in other words, we're going to call Joe Taylor and his team and present them with this uh, question, uh, like, can they help us? Uh, but I want to keep an open mind that that's one possibility it might work really, really well. But there's other protocols out there. NASA has been using protocols for deep space probes for years. Uh, so I didn't, didn't want to close any doors and just say, well, that's the only way we can do it. Yeah, we did have another interesting thing come up this morning. Uh, this is not new, but it is now uh, critically important that we make a decision. Uh, apparently, there's another another dish available to us uh, for free. You, you know how those things go. Uh, there's a 30-foot dish uh, in the backyard of a ham who passed away and his... his uh, and the people are uh, saying it has to go. Anyone who wants it can take it. Uh, and you just got to take it down. And they even offered to provide a crane to help remove it from the site because the crane's there anyway for some other reason. Uh, and so we're looking into that today. It's in Colorado, but it's a very long ways from Colorado Springs. It's it's the other direction. I can almost get to Colorado, I'm sorry, California, if I keep driving in that direction a little further. It's down near Durango someplace. But I, I'm willing to take my big trailer down there and pull it back. I don't know what we'll do with it, but. <laughs> Put it in your I, barn. I, <laughs> Another, I, saw that, uh, I, I sent it to, to the list because I thought, you know, maybe we could use another dish at the site. <laughs> well, actually, we're quite excited about that uh, possibility, but we're not sure that we have the financial resources to pay the crane operator and everything else. Uh, even my trailer may not be big enough. Uh, it, pre it probably isn't. I probably could carry about half of it. In my my trailer will carry eight thousand pounds. It's a 14, 14 foot bed dump trailer. Uh, it'll probably carry the weight of the whole thing if it's disassembled far enough. But a thirty foot dish 
has to be disassembled significantly and get into a bed that's 14 by seven. Uh, so uh, I can carry the weight, 8,000 pounds of payload capacity, but I don't know, right? We're thinking we might actually have to pay somebody with a bigger trailer and that starts getting real money and we have to, and they want it out of there sooner than later. Apparently they've been trying to get rid of it for a year. And now's the time. So I might drive down there and see what we can do. Wow. That's that's pretty exciting. Now 30 foot is is not big, but it's big for the average person. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I we have plenty of land to, to erect it uh, out there and we could use it for additional science experiments. Yeah, sure could. Wow. Well, that'll be, the, I guess, since it since there's some time pressure here, there'll be a resolution pretty quickly. Yeah, I think the resolution will be based not on, uh, on volunteer labor, but on money. Yeah. Uh, it's going to cost us to get it off that site. Yeah, I, I think your your instincts are, I think your instincts are good there, that this would be, you're going to have to hire some people to. But it's, it's not, this is a dish that was made by a ham for a ham so it's not as big and massive as the one we already have uh, this is something that actually could be moved it's we have at least four or five guys ready to go down there right now if there was any way uh to get a, a disassembled and off site and i'm yeah. really down with my trailer uh and a bunch of guys and see what we could do. But I think what we need is two trailers the size of mine to put all the parts on and then a lot of people to get the parts down into 14-foot chunks. Wow. Sure. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing how this turns out because <laughs> that's a, it's a pretty big big deal. Well, it's sort of like disassembling the Francis Scott Key Bridge. <laughs> well, hopefully not as... <laughs> Okay, Which, by <laughs> I see what way, you mean, but like, uh, hopefully, with uh, with doesn't require that much cleanup. So, well, when I rapid lived, unplanned disassembly of you know, when I lived small. in Maryland, that bridge is how I got to Micro Center. Oh boy! Now, if I was still there, I'd be really, really upset that I could not get to Micro Center in any reasonable way anymore. Yeah, I would. I would wow! So. Just to just to recap real quick, the um, the you're, you're interested in hearing uh, some feedback, getting feedback about the potential areas of coding gain for yes. for this attempt and uh, the the schedule. It looked like 2025 was the sort of the goal uh, for for making these attempts and pulling things together. Mm -hmm. That this was a sort of a goal, like not 10 years from now, not five years from now, but like oh, over yeah. the next year or two. We we have an issue. Uh, that one of the gain, one, one of the link budget items is how far away is Venus? And the perigee of Venus as related to us, that is closest point Venus comes to us, is next spring. Ah, well, this would be a really good time to, it's about to try. One, it's a one-year project. So they're calling it EVE 25. Okay. I, I have a big problem with that because I think this is a two-year long project. Well, at way. least, right? But it's it the perigee occurs once a year, so it's okay. I just don't like the name because I was deeply involved with a NASA project that had a, that had as part of its name uh, 2010, and they still haven't fielded it. Oh, right. I have, that's the Vigos project. And it is now just called the Vigos project, not VLBI 2010 or whatever the heck it was called back then, because they're 10 years behind schedule. Well, we this is did... this is a lesson that people learn all the time in podcasting, because if you launch a podcast and it's such and such weekly, then you're kind of on the hook for weekly podcast production. And as most of us that try to do things on a schedule, it's pretty pretty difficult to work your your schedule into your title because then you don't have plausible deniability when it becomes a monthly thing um, <laughs> or when it yeah. it takes 14 years longer to uh to deploy your thing I, but I mean, you're looking for you're looking for for like like 
uh, input feedback uh, uh, ideas uh, for for the for coding for any sort of DSP techniques to go yeah. along with all of the other stuff. And the timeliness is we have a net, about a, a a year like well, this, we the spring I mean, is a good a good ideally, time. Or? Ideally, we would have all of the various pieces we need: hardware and software. Uh, implemented, tested, and ready for deployment in one year. And that's pretty aggressive, I think, considering how difficult these each of these pieces are. Yeah, but it, I mean, from the meeting last night, it did sound like that there was at least some of these pieces already exist. They, the, the dish is not something that you have to find. Yeah. The... Well, the, big, the big pieces, we have a 60-foot dish. We, our proposal is to communicate with a dish in Germany, which is actually a little bigger than ours. They have a, a three or four dB, maybe a little more gain than we do. And that'll help close the link. Um, so because the link's out and back. So their their slightly bigger dish is good for us. So we have a lot of stuff. Yeah. And we have a lot of experience on both ends. They have in Germany, they have already bounced a pulse off of Venus and recovered it. Uh, and so they sort of know how to point in Venus and they know that it, something can be done. Cool. Okay. Well, we'll put the word out. And I think that your summary here uh, was, was, uh, was great. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this, uh, this project and, um, and seeing how things go. I think, just the just the efforts to kind of like uh, focus on this sort of a challenge is going to have some some knockdown effect uh, if it gets the attention which I I can't see why it wouldn't of the folks at WSJT then that will you know we'll be adding to that that code base uh, which is a great one um, and then you know looking at at uh, you know if, if you if you can just sort of like back up and say okay if if there was uh, no limitations on on the the coding part how would you how would you get the most amount of gain back on on this link will be a, a an instructive one so so we'll we'll get to work on that and we'll give you we'll give you what we what we can come up with um you know hopefully over the next uh a week or so thank you cool yeah no thank you this is uh this is really neat it's uh it's wonderful to to be uh, uh part of dses and uh to uh to collaborate and and to to hear about these sorts of things it's a, a just a great site. All right, any other comments or questions before we close? All right, thank you everybody. Uh, thank you to all of those that weren't able to make it to this particular meeting in person. Thanks to everybody that's that's watching this later. Uh, and uh, you know, just reach out if you need anything over the next week and if all goes well, we'll see you a week from today. All right.